Okay, great. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a little bit about how over the summer I've been using this program called SLIM to model population genetics in Pacific oysters. Um, this was not initially what I had planned for this summer, but since everything moved online, alongside mentoring some younger undergraduate students on a different project, I kind of turned my attention to um, learning some more, some more um, coding and using these programs to kind of model some population genetics that are going on within Pacific oysters. And so this work kind of grew out of work done by some other members of my lab that kind of surround this high mutation rate mystery. So it has been described in the literature that under neutral theory, the level of expected um, pairwise diversity can be described by this model. And this is kind of just a theory that is used really commonly in population genetics and, a fr and it's a framework for conceptually understanding how mutation develops new alleles in DNA sequences. And then therefore you can use that coupled with your effective population size, which is this NE variable here to estimate genetic diversity, which is your P variable here. I'll be using P and then pi interchangeably in this, but they both mean pairwise nucleotide diversity. And then mu here is your mutation rate parameter. And this is what we are most interested in in the context of Pacific oysters. So it has been estimated by Dennis Hitchcock, and most of this work was done in the 90s, that, that Pacific oysters and oysters in general have really low effective population sizes, anywhere between 50 and 500 individuals, which is significantly lower than you ex would expect for a species that is so um, widely dispersed. But if you take this 5 to 50 um, effective population size and you plug that in, to your equation here for expected nucleotide diversity. And then it, alongside that, use the measured nucleotide diversity p-value from the um, reference genome for the Pacific oysters. You come to this estimate of mutation rate being 10 to the minus 5 for Pacific oysters. And as you can even reach estimates as high as 10 to the minus 6 if you have this upper limit of 500 individuals which is extremely high for a mutation rate in any sort of eukaryote. For example, the mutation rate in humans is anywhere between 10 to the minus eight and 10 to the minus nine. So we're seeing um, orders of magnitude higher in these dispersing eukaryotes. But these are all just estimates taken from theoretical calculations and theoretical data. And the mutation rate had never actually been empirically measured in oysters up until recently. And that work was done by a member of my lab, Nate Churches. And what he did was he took two males and four females, strip spawned them, and then went through the larval rearing process, grew them up, and then extracted DNA, did library prep, Illumina sequence, both the parents and the offspring. And then through some bioinformatics work, he was able to tally the number of heterozygous mutations. In this case, that would be single nucleotide polymorphisms or SNPs. And then you can divide it by the total number of SNPs in these trios. So trios are two parents and their offspring. And then you can use those numbers to estimate the mutation rate. And it's important to note here that this is actually a really conservative estimate of mutation rate because you're only looking for heterozygous mutations. You're not looking for homozygous mutations or any other sort of mutations that may have happened throughout this F1 generation. And what he found is that in comparison to these expected mutation rates given the neutral theory here, they actually mirrored them almost perfectly. And this was a really, this is a really big deal because this mutation rate for the first time has been empirically measured and it is massive as compared to humans and other eukaryotes that usually sit approximately around 10 to the minus eight, 10 to the minus nine. So this is a really novel idea in a lot of eukaryotes. And so that kind of brought me to some of these other bigger research questions. The first being, is the observed mutation rate consistent with the standing variation that we see in the reference genome? The reference genome for the Pacific oyster isn't the greatest reference genome out there. And I was just really interested in looking at what, if this really aligns with what we are seeing in nature. And then second, how is an elevated mutation rate influencing other aspects of the genome? And how is this shaping kind of the genetic landscape of the genome in general, since this is a really novel and unique observation in eukaryotes? 
And then what's driving these observed high mutation rates in oysters? There's a couple different theories about what's driving these. Um, the most common being the sweepstakes reproductive success hypothesis, which was published by Dennis Hedgecock and some others um, more in the 90s. And this is the idea that extremely large variation in, this, in reproductive success due to these chaotic ocean environments are driving just huge amounts of mutations because you're not putting as much effort into your gametes because oysters are spitting out millions of gametes at a time during the spawning process into the water column. So this huge variation in reproductive success might be driving this. And then there's this other idea that maybe it's genetic draft or purifying selection that's going on in the background that's really driving this high mutation rate and keeping that standing variation fairly low. So then how would you actually go about answering that questions? Well, that's the, these questions, that's where SLIM comes into the picture. So SLIM was developed by the Messer Lab at Cornell University, which is a lab of evolutionary biology and population genetics. And it's basically just a forward evolutionary simulation framework. So what this means is it's a program that you can input your specific parameters to your organism or to your genomic landscape into. You can press play and you can see what's happening based on what's going on in the genome. And you can kind of draw these different conclusions based on these different parameters that you input. It's written in its own language that's very similar to R. And what really makes this program exciting and unique is that it allows for complex mating schemes and non-right fisher models. So your right fisher model is kind of the null model for population genetics, similar to, I can compare it to your Hardy-Weinberg type model where you have all these assumptions and this is kind of your null model. But there are many cases where you're breaking this null non right this right fisher model and you need to allow for that within the program, which is what SLIM does for oysters, allowing us to really um, emulate what's going on in the natural system very well with this program. And then it also allows you to model entire chromosomes for large populations, which is really important when we're interested in answering these complex questions about the genomic landscape. Um, so then you're, you start out with your simulation and you have to input specific parameters. So that took me to figuring out what do we already know about our system and what do we need to figure out? So some of the simulation parameter examples are mutation rate, recombination rate, effective population size, nucleotide diversity, these types of things are what we would input into our simulation. And a lot of these have already been published in the literature or are in the process of being published in the literature. So I will show you a quick example of this. So this is what the slim GUI kind of looks like. So what you have here is you put all of your code in into this section. And here is where you would put in your specific parameters to your model. So you have your carrying capacity, your mutation rate, your genomic elements. In this case, one genomic element, that's the length of the entire first chromosome of the Pacific oyster. And once this is all coded out, you can click play and see what's actually going on in this chromosome. So along this line, we can see different mutations arising within the chromosome and the height of these are the different, the frequency at which these mutations are in the genome. So that's just a little example of what that looks like. And so we input these parameters Sorry. So we input these parameters and we let it play. And then we hope that we can figure out something that's unique about our system and really answer some of these research questions. So that was the first simulation. And what, what I did this summer was I did 10 replicate runs sampling 10 individuals at the end of 500 generations into a VCF file output. Um, and these, this prelim, preliminary simulation run was mostly just exploratory to try and just get familiar with the program, get familiar with VCF files and VCF tools and actually calculating these summary statistics. Because these simulations are so large, we have to run them on the computing cluster. And so I just started with 10 replicate runs 
sampling 10 different haplotypes, so 10 unique individuals, in, try, in an attempt to kind of figure out what's going on here. And then you can use VCF tools on the VCF file output to calculate some summary statistics. So these would include things like linkage disequilibrium and then nucleotide diversity, which is really the parameter that we're interested in looking at in this case. And so when I did this across these 10 different runs, this is just the average nucleotide diversity for each of the 10 replicates. And as you can see, they, are, they were significantly different from each other, which pretty much just tells us something that we already knew, which is that we need to scale up these simulations. And that's pretty common. Like 10 simulations is not going to narrow down your variation enough to give you confidence in your data. So we're looking at doing 1,000 to 2,000 replicates of these simulations. But just getting them up and running was kind of the bottleneck for my work this summer. And then Another thing that we saw at this first simulation was really diving deeper into nucleotide diversity. So what you're seeing here is this is a single chromosome along the x-axis here on the y-axis is nucleotide diversity. And in this very first simulation, what I did was I set up the chromosome into three distinct sections. So the first and the last section had kind of what your average mutation rate would be for humans and other eukaryotes, so around 10 to the minus eight. But then this middle section, I elevated the mutation rate for to emulate that of the Pacific oyster at about 10 to the minus five. And we can see exactly what we would expect in that increase in nucleotide diversity. But what's interesting about this is that if you remember back to the parameters, nucleotide diversity is estimated in the reference genome to be about 0.13, somewhere in there. And here we have, we have a measure of nucleotide diversity in order of magnitude lower than what we would expect. So this is also very informative for us. It tells us that something needs to be changed in our simulation because we are not matching the natural organism as closely as we would like. And so that led me to the secondary simulations, which are running as we speak. Um, I've been having some cluster problems. They've been turning, um, switching nodes around and stuff, but they're up and running right now. And the goal of these simulations was to just more closely resemble the genetic landscape of the Pacific oyster. So in order to do this, we increased the number of generations to 2N, um, which is a pretty common thing to do with your simulation. So instead of running it for um, 50 or 500 generations, like I did in the first simulations, now we're going to run them for 4,000 generations and see if we can hone in on some of that um, variation. And then also we're going to, I increased the mutation rate to the observed upper limit of two to the minus five instead of just one to the minus five um, to see if we can really um, just get closer to the expected values that we are actually observing in the empirical data. And then I plan on doing a repeat sampling of 10 haplotypes, so 10 unique individuals from 10 replicate simulations and calculating the summary statistics for these as well. Um, so that's the current simulation, which I showed you earlier how SLIM was up and running and everything. And then that leads us to some future directions where the end goal for this is really just to continue improving the simulation to better resemble the natural system, increase these replicate runs, which um, is also going to be difficult because we need to be able to do a thousand plus replicates of these types of simulations in order to get all of the data we want. And then I will need to parse through that, those thousand replicates, all that data, bring it together and calculate the summary statistics of both the simulated data and then also the empirical data. So I plan on using the same three trios that Nathan Church has used for his mutation rate estimates. And I want to empirically calculate myself um, what the levels of linkage disequilibrium, pi, and some of these other parameters are given the trios that we already have um, sequenced and ready to go. And so a lot of acknowledgments go out to my SLIM team who helped me learn all of this, um, my two advisors and the entire lab. Um, unfortunately, this is what our lab meetings look like now. We don't get to see each other in person just over Zoom. 
Um, and then a big thanks to Nate Churches and Peter Chang, who did all of the mutation rate work and have continued to support me through this. And then the developers of Slim. Slim is um, open source and um, the developers have been very responsive online with any questions or concerns people have. And due to COVID, they actually put all of their workshop materials online for free. So I was able to teach myself how to use the program on my own with my Slim team. And that's all I really have.